Meet Graham. Graham is a physical 3D model designed in Australia by a crash specialist, an artist, and a surgeon demonstrating how we would need to evolve as humans if we were able to withstand high impact crashes. <laughs> a few obvious features that you can see is Graham's skull. He essentially has a built-in helmet to protect his brain. The flatness of his face with extra fatty tissue around his cheekbones to protect his nose and the long-term sinus effects associated with a broken nose. Graham doesn't get whiplash because he doesn't have a neck. And of course, his barrel-like chest with extremely thick ribs and extra fatty tissue to protect his vital organs. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how we look at it, we're not going to evolve to look like Graham anytime soon. Because genetically, we evolve much slower than we do from a cultural or from a societal perspective. Since the first steam-powered locomotives in the early 19th century, to the first cars which gave us the freedom to go wherever we want, whenever we want, transportation has become an integral part of our society. The benefits of modern day transportation and vehicle travel are obvious to all of us. But what we sometimes overlook is the high toll we pay for this freedom. Globally, over 1.3 million people die from car crashes every single year. In the US alone last year, 37,461 people thousand people died, and more people than the previous year. We're headed in the wrong direction. To try to put this into perspective, from when I came to this stage a few moments ago till I finished this talk, in just a few minutes, it is statistically likely that someone will die in a car crash in the US alone. We need to fundamentally change the way we think about safety. Up until this point, when we thought about safety, it, it has always been reactive. How can we assist or protect the driver and the passengers at the point of impact? How can we assist them when they're in a critical situation about to be in a crash? And we need to start thinking proactively. How can we prevent these situations from occurring to begin with? Right? We don't want to get them in a, we don't want them to be in a difficult situation. And of course, to prevent the crash altogether. Well, let's take a step back and look at some other forms of transportation. Because it turns out that commercial air travel and travel by trains are much safer than getting in your car every single day. Now, what are some of the main differences? Well, trains and planes are operated by professionals. My grandfather hasn't driven in over 15 years, and he can still legally get in the car, he has a valid driver's license, and go drive down the street. Trains and planes operate on scheduled times, and they have predetermined routes. And lastly, they're in touch with the control center that acts as an additional pair of eyes for them and keeps them connected at all times. When we look at the driving environment, you're forced, you're forced to operate in a confined, chaotic environment. You're stuck on the road, there's nowhere else to go. You're stuck on your side of the road. And then when you add to that, uh, trying to understand what the vehicle in front of you is doing, you have to use your intuition. You don't know what the next movement they are going to make. When you add to that, motorcyclists, cyclists, pedestrians, potholes to the mix, you only add fuel to the fire. So what's the solution on how we can begin to improve safety today? Well, if you have a newer vehicle, you might be lucky enough to have some driver assistance features built in, such as a forward collision warning or something like that. Well, that's really nice because that gives you advanced warning of a crash, but you're limited to the line of sight. This driver has no clue what's going on beyond the tractor trailer which means that the maximum warning they can receive is usually one, maybe two seconds. Autonomous vehicles, are these going to solve the situation? Yeah, machines are safer than humans because they don't get distracted and feel the need to respond to a text while they're driving or change the radio station. But with the first autonomous vehicles hitting the road in a few years from now and decades for them to become commonplace, it will be irresponsible of us to rely on autonomous vehicles to be the answer to safety. Well, let's look to nature and see what we can learn from there. If you look up at a flock of birds, hundreds of birds flying in the sky with beautiful formations and turning at an instant 180 degrees, you don't see a few birds falling out of the sky because they're bumping into each other. Well, the secret is that birds communicate with each other in real time. 
They constantly send messages to the closest birds in their vicinity so that they make sure they can operate safely together. They have evolved to, drive safe, to fly safely together. And what we can do is we can try to mimic this on the road. We all share the road. We all use the road. If we can use vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-pedestrian, vehicle-to-cyclist, vehicle-to-infrastructure, and essentially get everyone connected, the more people that join the network, the safer it becomes. And it turns out that this is something that is live today, and we have live vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle networks in San Francisco, Manhattan, Tel Aviv, and rolling it out across the state of Nevada by using ubiquitous technology. Smartphones. Turns out you can use them for more than just looking at funny and cute cat videos. This smartphone here is exponentially more powerful than the computer used to send the first person to the moon. Why not use it to build a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle platform? Inside of every one of our smartphones, we have cameras. Those cameras are connected to extremely so strong processors known as CPUs and GPUs, which allows us to have live computer vision on the phone. You have sensors such as accelerometers and gyroscopes, which are extremely precise and accurate, and those allow you to understand the movement of the vehicle. And when you combine these technologies, add in GPS, and the fact that your phone is already connected to a network, you have the ability from a single phone to see, feel the road, and share that information with relevant vehicles around you. You can see on the top right over here, not only are we identifying vehicles, the type of vehicle, your distance, the angle that they are, the, the change in speed, and of course, the exact movement of the vehicle itself. And when you combine all of this information and you start sharing it on the road, all of a sudden, we have a much safer network. You can share the information if I know that you are making a right-hand turn in 300 feet and I happen to see a child in the road. I can let you know about that immediately from the algorithms inside of my phone. If you are on a highway road that's one lane in each direction, instead of having to veer out to see if you can pass, why not receive that message from the vehicle in front of you that can see and has a clear line of sight or from the oncoming vehicle? And if we go back to the vehicle that we looked at before, you don't need to have that newer vehicle because even if you don't have it, you probably have a smartphone in your pocket. And you can use that for a driver assistance features and to be connected to the network. So instead of having to wait for this traffic, for this tractor trailer to break, you can receive the message from five or six cars in front of you saying, hey, you're going to have an emergency break in six, seven, eight seconds from now. Start to break less aggressively, less chance of getting hit from behind. And if it's relevant, why not share that message with the vehicles behind you as well? And if we do that, we can take phones, which are currently the most dangerous device that you have in the car with you, and turn it into the ultimate driving companion. And by doing so, there's no need for us to evolve to look like Graham.